Good morning and welcome back to our Bible study at Grace Lutheran Church. We are continuing a series that we have begun on church membership. Today we will be picking up with part nine of this study. We're moving now into the second part. We have considered the background for what membership is. And today we're going to be moving forward to why this is an important thing and what we do in order to encourage one another in our Christian faith and in our membership within our Christian congregation. This morning I'd like to begin with another hymn from the hymnal. This is in the invitation section of the hymnal and is a reminder of the Lord's calling to each one of us, an invitation bringing us to His throne of grace where we receive the mercy that we all need. Let's pray. Today thy mercy calls us to wash away our sin. However great our trespass, whatever we have been. However long from mercy our hearts have turned away, thy precious blood can cleanse us and make us white today. Today thy gate is open, and all who enter in shall find a father's welcome and pardon for their sin. The past shall be forgotten, a present joy be given, a future grace be promised, a glorious crown in heaven. Today our Father calls us, His Holy Spirit waits, His blessed angels gather around the heavenly gates. No question will be asked us how often we have come. Although we oft have wandered, it is our Father's home. O all-embracing mercy, O ever-open door, what should we do without thee when heart and eye run o'er? When all things seem against us to drive us to despair, we know one gate is open, one ear will hear our prayer. Amen. As I mentioned, we're picking up with the second part of this study on church membership. Up to this point, we have covered what membership is really all about. And today we're going to be taking a look at section 9. This particular section is again going to go back to our church constitution and what our constitution says, particularly about removal from church membership and why this is an important part. We're going to take a look at the scriptural foundation for this part of our constitution as well. You can find this particular study, if you're watching this on YouTube, just below in the description there should be a link which you can use to download this particular study that we will be reading through today. We're going to read through the introduction to the second part. We have looked so far at what God says about the spiritual blessings of gathering together for worship and what it means to be a member of a Christian congregation. What do we do when members of a congregation, not due to distance or illness, do not attend worship services over a long period of time? What steps should be taken to try and lead them back? So these are some of the questions that we're going to be taking a look at, not just this week, but also next week in part 10 of our study. What is it that a congregation can do in order to help those who have strayed away from God's word and are not making use of not only his word and sacrament, but also the, of the fellowship that we share in a Christian congregation? And this isn't something that we have to just answer on our own. The Lord himself gives us direction as to how we as Christians are to reach out in love and concern for our fellow believer in a situation like this. So part nine now is Grace's constitution and how it describes removal from membership. Now as we've talked about in previous episodes, different congregations are going to have different ways of describing this, but they're all going to have as their foundation the very same passages. So the way in which they describe some of these things or the names that they use might be slightly different from one constitution to the next. But generally, constitutions have a variety of different ways of, of dealing with a, what we would call termination of membership. Uh, so an individual can ask to be released from membership. They can be uh, transferred to another congregation in the same, same fellowship. Or we can also deal with what's called excommunication. And there are different breakdowns in each one of those categories. But we're going to be taking a look at what each one of those is, how they are carried out, 
and why. So we begin with Grace's Constitution. In our Constitution, this is found in Article 4, and the title of this article is Excommunication, Removal, and Dismissal. Here we have a quote from our Constitution. Members who, by removal from this community or for any other valid reason, are given a peaceful and honorable release from the congregation, as also such who, after patient and loving admonition, according to Matthew 18, 15 through 18, must be excommunicated by the congregation, or who, by evading and refusing to submit to church discipline, have thereby terminated their fellowship and membership in the congregation, shall thereby relinquish all their rights in the property and funds of the congregation. Any member who feels that he or she has been removed from membership in an unscriptural manner has the right to appeal the case to the synod. Compare the Constitution and Bylaws of the Church of the Lutheran Confession, 2008 edition or later, Bylaw 6. So that is a direct quote from our congregation's constitution in describing removal or excommunication or termination of membership. Now, this particular article right here in our constitution, the main purpose that it serves is to show that there are a variety of different ways that people are no longer a member of this congregation. Some of those are good, some of those are not as good. But when a person is released from membership in any one of those ways, they, they relinquish or give up their right to the work of the congregation, to the property, to the funds of the congregation, everything as a whole. And this is something that has to be placed in a church constitution because there are times when there is a, a split in the congregation or there's uh, other things that are taking place where people who have left the congregation then come back and they want to get their hands on either the funds or part of the property or something along those lines. So this particular article is in here for a more a legal reason. And as we go on later on in the bylaws, we'll get into a little bit more of the detail as far as the, the spiritual way in which this is handled. But the value of this, this first section here in the Constitution itself is that it does point to the fact that there are a variety of different ways in which people lose or give up their membership in a Christian congregation. So let's look at the first part of this. Members who by removal from this community or for any other valid reason are given a peaceful and honorable release. So there is our number one. So number one, one of the ways in which a person would give up their their association, their work in the church, their rights to the property of the church would be through what we call a peaceful release. And, and this is what we would call a transfer. So when you have a member of, of our congregation, for example, and they move to another part of the country and they are now closer to another congregation that we are in fellowship with in the Church of the Lutheran Confession, we would, we would transfer their membership to that congregation. Now, we don't just, we don't just decide, hey, we're going to transfer their membership. I would talk to that individual. My, in my ministry, I've always encouraged people to be members in the congregation which they are closest to so that they can be actively involved in the congregation. They can receive the blessings that the congregation offers. So it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street. And... In the first part of our study, the first eight sections here, we've talked about how important that is, that we are fed by what the Lord offers to us through our Christian congregation, but also how we have the opportunity then to serve others within the Christian congregation by using the gifts and the abilities, the talents that God has given to us in order to benefit our fellow believer. So it's, it's valuable then for us to be connected to that congregation that we are closest to in distance so that we can then make use of the blessings that they offer and again give our, our gifts back to that congregation and the fellow members there too. So number one would be a peaceful release. And that's a good thing. 
Sometimes it can be difficult for a congregation to lose members. But if we are transferring their membership to another Christian congregation where they're going to be actively involved and they're going to be fed and served, that is a, that's a wonderful thing. They're going to continue to, to use their gifts in the work of God's church here on earth. So th this one here is a, is a positive as far as the church as a whole. Now the second one talks about a second aspect he also says, as also such who, after patient and loving admonition, according to Matthew 18, 15 to 18, must be excommunicated by the congregation. So this would be number two, excommunication. And notice there that there's, again, a scriptural reference that is included in the Constitution, Matthew chapter 18, 15 to 18. It's also important that in the Constitution we realize that this idea of excommunication, which is often seen as kind of a nasty or a negative word, is actually prefaced by something very important. He says, also such who after patient and loving admonition they are then excommunicated according to those steps that are outlined in Matthew chapter 18. So we're going to talk a little bit more about excommunication when we get down into the next section. But just at this point, let's understand that excommunication isn't something that a church is supposed to carry out saying, well, I don't like who you are, so we're going to kick you out of the church. Many times when I ask confirmation students and other people, well, when we hear the word excommunication, what do you think of or what is that? They'll say, well, that's when somebody gets kicked out of the church. That is not what excommunication is. And that is not the idea that we should be portraying in the idea of excommunication. Excommunication is something that takes place out after patient and loving admonition has been carried out out of love and concern for that individual. But again, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. There's now a third category that we have in the Constitution. It says, or those who by evading or refusing to submit to such church discipline have thereby terminated their fellowship and membership in the congregation. So number three here would be what we would often call termination. So termination of membership, there's a couple of different ways that this can take place. In order to get to excommunication, you have to go through the steps that are outlined in Matthew chapter 18. And what happens many times is as you're going through those steps in Matthew chapter 18, you have an individual who says, you know what, I, I don't want to have any more contact with you. I don't want to hear this anymore. And so they say, I would like, I'd like to be released from membership. And so what ends up happening then is if you don't complete the, the steps that Jesus has laid out out of love for that individual, then they would have their membership terminated. They ask to be released from membership. So we would terminate their membership either because, as it says here, they evade or refuse to submit to that loving and patient admonition by the congregation. Uh, so another time, in other, in other cases, you might have somebody who just says, you know what, I, I, I don't want to be a member here. I, I've joined another church somewhere else that's not in your fellowship. There would be another example of where we would terminate a person's membership. We can't transfer them to a false teaching church. And so if we haven't worked through the steps of church discipline, you can't excommunicate them either. So we would terminate their membership. And then if they join another church, uh, that's something that they, they can do. Uh, usually, if a person is going through the steps of excommunication and they say, well, I, I don't want this to happen anymore. I don't want you to keep, keep knocking on my door or calling me. Uh, the letter of termination is, again, a warning to the individual of, of where they are headed if there is sin that is involved. And we'll talk a little bit more about that again in the next section. So these are the three major areas or ways in which a person's membership is, it comes to an end in a Christian congregation, either by a peaceful release, 
excommunication or termination of membership. And I suppose we could probably put a fourth category up here. It's not mentioned in our Constitution, and it, it would probably be pretty obvious. It's kind of related to a peaceful release, and that would be if a person dies. Uh, if a person passes away, that's very similar to a peaceful release. They have been transferred from the church militant here on earth to the church triumphant in heaven. So they are no longer a part of our visible, physical fellowship here at Grace, but they have now taken up a residence with the, the Savior in, in heaven. So death would be a fourth way in which a person would uh, no longer be a member in a Christian congregation. So we'll come back to those top three here in just a minute. One thing before we go on to the summary, I would like to emphasize the last phrase in our church constitution. It says there that any member who feels that he or she has been removed from membership in an unscriptural manner has the right to appeal the case to the synod. Now this is in our our synodical constitution, it's there for a reason. If a congregation is misusing excommunication and they are not going through the loving and patient steps of church discipline as Jesus outlines in Matthew chapter 18 and they just say, you know what, we don't like this individual, we're going to get rid of them. If that were to happen in a Christian congregation, it is important that that person has, has the ability to come back and say, I have been wrongly excommunicated. And they can approach, they should approach the congregation to begin with. If the congregation won't respond to that, they have the right then to appeal that at a synodical level. Now, I'm not aware of, of that ever taking place within our, our midst. Um, actually, I, I think I've heard about two situations that were very unique situations. And in both of those cases, the congregation did carry out the steps of church discipline as they should have. There was something else that was going on behind the scenes in that, those particular cases. But, and I have heard of a lot of churches outside of our fellowship that do abuse excommunication and do use it as a tool in order to get rid of people that, that they don't like. For example, I heard one, one account of a, of a church that said that they had a, the, the pastor had a friend who was very musical, but they had already had an organist. And so what happened is the church, the pastor encouraged the church to excommunicate their current organist so that he could bring in his good friend in order to serve as the music leader of the congregation. Now that was a story that was told to me by somebody many years ago of another church body down in the Atlanta area. So I have heard that those things do take place in churches outside of our fellowship, but I've never heard of one of our churches misusing excommunication in a way like that. But it is, we are human beings, and so this is listed here because of sin. And, and again, if somebody has had that happen to them, they do have recourse to go through the Church of the Lutheran Confession to appeal if they have been wrongly excommunicated. Let's go to the summary at the bottom of point A. We previously, we previously considered poor and sinful reasons for someone to separate themselves from a congregation. When this continues, despite counseling from God's word, that person has, in effect, separated themselves from the congregation. The membership of such a person is either excommunicated or terminated. So again, we kind of come back to these two points here, points two and three, when that takes place and they have separated themselves from a Christian congregation, there are two steps that we can take, and that is either to excommunicate them, uh, and we're going to, again, get into that in the next section, whether that be because of a sinful lifestyle or a neglecting the means of grace, uh, you go through those steps, or simply they say, I, we want to join another church body, we're no longer happy here, it's not a church that's in fellowship with us, we would terminate their membership, uh, then enabling them to join that congregation, but not transferring them to that congregation and, and condoning the fact that they are joining a, a church body that, that is not faith, com entirely faithful to the Word of God. So the key in this paragraph, and this goes back to what excommunication is all about. 
I mentioned earlier that some people view excommunication as kicking someone else out of the church. But excommunication is, is that final step in Matthew chapter 18. And let's, let's review those four steps in Matthew chapter 18. Step one in Matthew chapter 18 is that we go to them one-on-one. -on -one. So if somebody is sinning, if they have either sinned against us or we know that they are living in a sinful way, that they have done something that they should not have done, the first step that Jesus outlines is to go to your brother and speak to him by yourself. So we're not going to spread gossip. We're not going to talk to other people about what has been going on. Out of love and concern for that individual, I first am going to reach out to that person that I know has sinned, and I'm going to say, this is what God says about these actions. This is why God doesn't like this, and this is what it leads to if you continue down that path. Now, Jesus says, each one of these four steps, the ultimate purpose of all four is to lead the individual to repentance, to recognize that they have sinned against God and possibly against their neighbor, to lead them to repent of that sin and to trust in Jesus for forgiveness. So number one, we would go to them one-on-one -on -one and we would say, here's, here's the problem. Here's what God's word has to say about this particular situation. Now, if they repent, Jesus says, that's good, you've won your brother. That's it. That's where it stops. If the individual realizes their sin, they confess their sin, they repent of their sin, you have won your brother, they are still a part of, of that fellowship. If they refuse to listen when I go to them or you go to them and speak to them about their particular sin, then Jesus says step two is to bring witnesses. So now you would bring other fellow believers along with you in order to speak to that individual, in order to demonstrate this isn't just my feeling. This isn't just what I think. I don't like you, and so I'm, I'm going to make you feel miserable. That's not what this is about. Here are some other individuals who are also bearing witness to the fact that this is what God says. This isn't just my idea. This is God's will for you in this situation. So those witnesses are to confirm the word that was spoken to begin with and to say, this is what God has to say. Now again, if the individual hears those witnesses, maybe he didn't listen to me or to you on that first step, but now they realize that what has been spoken to them about what God says about their lifestyle, that they are, they are living in sin, they're doing something that God doesn't want them to do, and they're led to repentance, that's where it ends. We receive our, our Christian brother. But if the individual still doesn't believe, if they still re reject that witness... Then Jesus tells us to go on to step three. And step three, now again, notice there's, there's nothing in here that is done out of spite, out of hate. This is to be done with patience. It's to be done in love for that individual. Paul says, speak the truth in love. This is all done out of love for the individual. And it's important that we don't go and say, oh, you're a miserable wretch, but rather out of love and concern for you, I'm bringing this to your attention. This is what Jesus wants for you. So after you have the witnesses that come, then Jesus says, tell it to the church. So each one of these steps gets a little bit bigger. It begins with just an individual. And then you gather just a couple of individuals, and this isn't to spread rumors, it's to bring, again, witnesses to verify what God says about this particular situation. And that's the same thing that's true with step number three, when we tell it to the church. The church also then has that opportunity to, to say, this is what God's word says. And then finally, Jesus says, if, if you, once you tell it to the church, his final step is, let that person be to you as a heathen and, 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 and as a tax collector. Now, the heathen and the tax collector in the Jewish mindset, those were outsiders. And so, in other places in the scriptures, we have this described a little bit more. For example, in 1 Corinthians and then later on again in 2 Corinthians. Also in Thessalonians, you have a couple of examples of this. 
Paul says, deliver such a one, a person who is caught up in sin, who you've gone through these steps of discipline. When he gets to excommunication, Paul says, deliver such a one to Satan. And that's, that's a pretty graphic and it's a pretty descriptive picture of what is actually taking place in excommunication. Deliver that one over to Satan. Uh, excommunication or uh, tell it to the church and then let them be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Deliver such a one over to Satan. But we do that so that they might realize their sin and be led to repentance. So the word ex communication, if you break that word down, right here you have the word X, and X comes from the word, well, we have the word exit, that is a part of that, it means to go out of. And communication, in that word communication, you have the word communion. Communion is the fellowship that we've talked about in previous lessons. And so excommunication is out of fellowship. So the key part of excommunication is, just as we read in that summary, when an individual is, is going through this process through sin, sin separates us from God. An individual who is caught up in sin, it doesn't matter if it's step one or step two or step three or if it's step four, an individual has separated themselves from God. They've separated themselves from God's word, from his sacraments, from the forgiveness that he offers, from hearing the word which speaks about their sin. And so excommunication is, is not really an action on behalf of the church, but a declaration from the church to the sinner. It's a declaration that says, you have separated yourself from God by continuing in this sin. And since you have separated yourself from God and you have not been willing to listen to what God has to say for you, you are no longer a part of our visible fellowship either. This is a dangerous place. So it's not, it's not something that we're saying, oh, you can no longer come to church. It's a warning to that individual that says, by your actions, by your lack of repentance, you have removed yourself from God and from the blessings that he desires to offer to you. And until you repent of those things and hear what God has to say for you both in his law and in his gospel, you are no longer able to receive the blessings that God offers through his church, especially in the sacraments, through a lack of repentance. So excommunication is not so much an action of the church, but a declaration of the church that the individual has already separated themselves. They are just acknowledging and pointing to the person that this is what you have done by your actions. It's not something that we're doing. It's something that you are doing by your actions. A congregation always, again, each one of these steps, ultimately, the purpose is to lead the individual back to repentance. So, Step four, excommunication, is the ultimate preaching of the law. Deliver such a one over to Satan. But with the hope, with the desire that that person will realize that the gravity, the weight of the situation in which he is in and his sin and be led to repentance, to know that Jesus is the hope that he or she has as they face that troubling weight of their sin. So this summary is a, a valuable one to remind us of what excommunication is, that it is simply the sinner separating themselves from God, not the church saying, you can't come back anymore. Let's go on to part B, Grace's Constitution. This is the bylaws of our congregation. This is going to get a little bit more into detail here. This is Article 6, Admission and Release of Members. This is part five. We're going to skip over part six. We're going to do part five and part seven, which deal with these aspects of uh, at release and, and admin, uh, admission. Discipline. A member delinquent in the proper discharge of his or her duties toward the congregation or guilty of any manifest or public sin or offense, see articles two and three of the Constitution, shall be dealt with in keeping with our Lord's instruction, Matthew 18, 15 to 20. 
Excommunication and reinstatement of such members shall be considered valid only if enacted by the unanimous vote of the members present at a regular meeting of the congregation. See also Article 4 of the Constitution. We read that earlier up above on this sheet. So let, let's break this down again just a little bit, bit by bit. The first line there says, a member delinquent in the proper discharge of his or her duties toward the congregation. Now this is a broad category. And as you go into other parts of the Constitution, that's laid out a little bit more clearly. But delinquent in the proper discharge of his or her duties, that would include our pastor. It would include our teachers. So they are called by the congregation to carry out particular tasks. And if we feel, that, again, we're going to reach out to these individuals. If our pastor or our teachers aren't doing the job that they should be doing, we're going to reach out to them. We're going to say, you know, this is some things that you need to be doing. Let's work on that. We're going to encourage them to begin with. But after ongoing patient and loving admonition, if they will not carry out the work or the duty that the congregation has called them to do, then we can go through these, these steps in our Constitution to uh, terminate their membership. So number one, delinquent in the proper discharge of his or her duties. Now, in addition to pastor and teacher, we might have other categories of our congregation as well. Let's talk about church council members. Now again, different congregations are going to have different groups of people that are involved. You might have elders. You might have deacons. So whatever offices your congregation has set up, we also have not only a church council, but we also have church officers. So church officers would include our president, treasurer, recording secretary, financial secretary. So those are some of the offices that we have. And then we have four men that are also on our church council. So these would be different individuals that are asked to carry out particular duties on behalf of our congregation. And, and if any one of these individuals are not carrying out their duties as they should, again, after patient and loving concern and direction, if they refuse to do that, then the congregation can take action to terminate their membership. Now it goes on, and this is, this is related to this. It's not just willful neglect of, of duty. That, that is a, a sin. If a person is asked to do something, they have an agreement to do these things, and they refuse to do it, that involves sin. But let's look at the second part of this. Or, if they are guilty of any manifest or public sin or offense. Now, this gets a little bit broader. It's possible that we could have a pastor, a teacher, a church council member, or a church officer who is also guilty. They're, not, they're doing their duty, but maybe they're guilty of some public sin that everybody knows about or a manifest sin. That means a, a sin that is, is an obvious thing. So if they're guilty of any of these things, or we could just have a regular member. It doesn't have to be a person who has a duty in the church, one of the four categories up above. Anyone, any member of the congregation who is guilty of manifest or public sin, as it said there, is to be dealt with in keeping with our Lord's instruction in Matthew chapter 18. So that's where this comes in with the, the steps of excommunication. If your brother sins, go and tell him his, his fault between you and him alone. That's step one. That could be our pastor, it could be our teachers, it could be our church council members, our church officers, or any member within the congregation. If anyone is found guilty of sin, it is the responsibility that Christ has given to his church here on earth in order to reach out to that individual in order to point to the sin with the hope that it will lead to repentance, turning them away from their sin and back to their Savior. So the last part of this phrase here it points to the fact that this action, once we get to excommunication in Matthew chapter 18, when it gets to that step four, this can't just be a majority. In order to carry out an excommunication against a member, pastor, teacher, church council member, church officer, anybody, if it's going to be an excommunication of the church, it has to be the unanimous vote 
of the voters that are present at that meeting. In other words, it can't be 99%. Everybody has to be in agreement that this is what needs to be done. And again, this goes back to the fact that this is supposed to be done in patience and in love toward the individual who is caught in sin. So unanimous vote. So that's not only true of the excommunication itself, but also on the other end. If this excommunication leads the sinner to realize his or her sin, and they now come back to the church and they say, I realize now that what I have done is wrong, in order to receive them back into the fellowship, that also needs to be a unanimous vote by the members of the voters' assembly. So again, not, not 80%. Not 90%, but 100% of the voters, both in excommunication and then also in reinstatement back into the congregation. Let's go on to point seven in the bylaws of the Constitution. If a communicant member shall, despite warning against fellowshipping with the heterodox, become a member of a heterodox church, his or her membership in this congregation shall be terminated. So one of the features here, this goes now from excommunication down to termination of membership. And one of the categories that we have in our church constitution is if a member of our congregation, maybe they haven't been coming to church for a while, maybe they're distant from our church, and they join another church that is not in fellowship with our church body, the Church of the Lutheran Confession, that is reason for termination. So the congregation here can terminate the membership of that, that individual because they have joined a false teaching church body. Now notice it does say there, at the very beginning it says, if they will or shall, despite warning. So in other words, the congregation, before you get to termination, the congregation, whether that be a pastor or family members of that individual, they should reach out to that individual and say, this is not what God wants for you. This is the danger of joining that particular church. It is not true teaching in this particular category. If it's a Mormon church or if it's a, you know, whatever church it might be, we want to point out that there are dangers associated with that particular church, that it is false teaching in certain categories or certain areas. If they continue to say, yes, I want to join that church, even though we have warned them against that, then the congregation can terminate their membership. In my ministry, when I've had situations like this that have come up, whether it be because of a distance from our church or maybe there's, there's just friction between an individual and a member of the particular congregation that they're a part of and they want to join a different church in order to get away from that. I, as a pastor, I, I warn them, number one, of, of the false teachings that are in the church that they're thinking about joining or have joined. But I also try to warn them about if it's a situation where they're leaving simply because they don't like somebody else or they've had a run-in with somebody else in the congregation, that we need to remember that it's not, about, it's not about what kind of a relationship we have with other people. We want that to be a good relationship. God wants that to be a good relationship. But more important than that is the truth. And a lot of times the truth plays second fiddle to how we feel. And so instead of working on that relationship and trying to restore a relationship that has been broken, which again is what God wants us to do, many, take, many times we take the easy way out and we just say, well, I'm going to join a different church because it's easier or I like it better. And, and Christ says, that's, that's not what I want for you. The most important reason in joining a church, as we saw earlier in our study, is whether or not that church teaches the truth of God's word. And, and then the Lord calls us then to work together in love with those that we are in fellowship with. We might not always see eye to eye on the things that we agree about or discuss as a congregation, but if we are joined and united in the truth of God's word, we will work together in order to resolve our differences, in order to work through differences, and to to be united in the work that the Lord has given to us as a Christian congregation. So we, we do have the ability to terminate the membership of somebody in, in a situation like that. But again, we want to do that after we have demonstrated patient and loving
concern for that individual and showing them the dangers of where they're going and also the danger of not working through situations within the congregation that does teach the truth. Let's go to the summary at the bottom of this page. When a member is living in open sin, he or she is corrected in love on the basis of God's word. If the sin continues without repentance, it is brought before the congregation and the member is excommunicated by the voters. In such cases, the congregation is following the Savior's command, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There are just two passages that are listed in this section of our study. Matthew chapter 18 is mentioned twice, and then at the very end we have also Matthew 16. That's the one place in Scripture where it speaks about the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which is where we have the section of our catechism is based on that, uh, the ministry of the keys, locking and unlocking the door to heaven. And again, that's not something that we as a church do, just like this last step of, of excommunication. It's not the church itself that is locking or unlocking the door to heaven. We do that as individuals by our sin, and the Lord does that. He opens that door through the work of the Holy Spirit. So it's not something that we are doing, but rather it is a declaration of God's church that Christ has opened the door for you through his work on the cross and through the, the faith that the Holy Spirit has worked in your heart, or you have closed that door by your willful sin, continuing on in sin, we are just declaring whether or not that door is locked or unlocked because of a person's sin or their rejection of the work of God in, in and, and for them. So these passages are important, but there are many other passages in Scripture that also lay a foundation for these truths. As I mentioned, First and Second Corinthians, the passages that deal with excommunication. There's the passage in Ephesians 4 that talks about speaking the truth in love. In James chapter 5, James speaks about uh, leading an ind individual out of sin and saving a soul from death. So there are many, many other passages throughout the scriptures that also discuss this particular area of lovingly approaching our fellow believers in order to keep them within the fold of Christ or to lead them back to the fold of Christ because of not only our love for them, but more importantly, because of Christ's love them. So this was section 9, the first part of our, our study on how the church then deals with membership issues, particularly those that are not making use of the means of grace or, and are not being involved in the, in the earthly uh, congregation or fellowship that we share here. Next week, we're going to take up uh, part 10 of this study which is why do we care about our inactive members? And we're going to talk a few, about a few more of those passages that I mentioned just briefly today, next week in our study on part 10. Again, if you're just joining us, if you look down below in the video at the very bottom in the description, you can find a link to this particular study where you can print it off and you can review the things that we have gone through today. Let's close with the blessing of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.